Now today, you're seeing 30, 40 women getting signed for their one song. And you were saying that it's not the success of Nikki that they responded to, it's the success of Cardi and Megan the yeah, Stallion as, that they responded to. As soon as they saw that you can have artist after artist breaking, because remember, everyone always- So, so you're saying Nikki seemed like an anomaly, but then Cardi and Megan was like, no, it's not an anomaly. It's not an anomaly. This is something that's happening. Because remember, everyone, the thing that always makes me laugh is when they said that like Nicki Minaj came off a 10 year dry spell since Miss Education Lauren Hill. That couldn't be further from the truth. In the 10 years between the Miss Education Lauren Hill and the arrival of Nicki Minaj, we still had albums from Missy Elliott. We still had albums from Lil' Kim. We still had albums from Eve, Remy Ma, Trina. The problem was the label stopped investing in signing new women. So any woman who before BL, before Lauren, right? Right? Any woman who came before Lauren was able to get in and stay in, but they weren't investing in anyone new. The tour ratio. Okay, though. The tour ratio. Okay, though. That might be the best question I've ever been asked. <laughs> You're a phenomenal person. I mean, you legendary. I am a fan of you, my brother. So continuing my celebration of the 50th anniversary of hip hop. I wanted to get together a panel of women who love hip hop to talk about hip hop history. I thought about it after I watched the amazing documentary on Netflix, Ladies First. So most of these people have something to do with that documentary. We got Carrie Twig, who was an executive producer on that and worked in the Obama White House. We have Kathy Yandeli, who is an academic. She wrote the book that Ladies First springs from, The Hip Hop History of Women. She's at NYU now. And my old friend Drew Dixon, who worked in the industry as an A&R and is part of hip hop history from that side. So we got three women who are brilliant and love hip hop. And I love this conversation. Let's get into it. It's women, Kathy, Drew, and Carrie talking about hip hop on Touré Show. Drew, what do you love about hip hop? And I know you have loved mm. hip hop for a long time. Wow. So what I loved, past tense about hip-hop and what I love about it now are slightly different things. Um, but I have loved the fact that I believe hip-hop embodies the resilience, the genius, the innovation, the rebellion of the people who are the descendants of the transatlantic slave trade. The swagger of the people whose drums were taken away, Hell innovating yeah. again and creating brilliance in the way that black people do. And ultimately changing the world, changing the culture. For sure. For sure. Carrie, what do you love about hip hop? I love that it's so expansive. I mean, I think it's it has from its inception, and of course with exception, but has been about innovation, has been about expanding boundaries, has been about rule breaking, has been about defying convention, expectation. And so it is... Um, it has evolving boundaries, and so it's gotten to be multiple different things. It gets to mean different things to different people in different parts of the country and different parts of the world and still be recognizable and tangible um, across across yes. genre and across boundaries. Yes, I love that. I have always loved how we can take anything, a disco song, a pop song, a jazz song, and make it hip-hop. I have some vision of some movie where there's a transparent monster that's eating anything it can find <laughs> right. and it makes the monster bigger. Like we can take yeah. anything and make it hip hop. I, I love that about us too. Kathy, what do you um, love? I love how it makes me feel. Like if rap is like rhythm and poetry, mm -hmm. right? The lyrics, but then also like the right beat. Like I remember I had listened to hip hop prior to becoming obviously a part of it, but I remember the song that moved me was the opening beat of Mass Appeal, that's for me where it hit me in the gut. And I was like, oh. Gangstar, hell yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, how the right beat or the right lyric can just, I don't know, it just like. Was that Mass Appeal beat, was that the first time that you were like, oh, I love this? 
Yeah, and I the first time I was drawn to hip hop was the ladies' first video, Latifah okay. and Moni Love. Okay, that was where oddly I was like, oh wait, like these girls are badass, and I I'm ten years old, and maybe one day I could be a badass. But when that feeling, the one that like made me want to cry, was the Mass Appeal beat. I remember it. What was the song Drew that you were like, oh my god, what was that? Eric B is president. Um. I heard it, and it's always embarrassing because so many of my hip hop stories happen on Martha's Vineyard. <laughs> but that's where I met all the New York kids. You know, I was from DC, so I was go go. Right, right. But right. on the Vineyard, I met like the kids from New Rochelle, and I was meeting my then boyfriend. Who I'd met at the Jack and Jill Eastern Regional oh, you're Convention. Just killing himself. Wow. You're just killing myself right now. Here we go. Did he take you to the cotillion? <laughs> no, not quite that bad. And I was working at a toy store in Vineyard Haven, and he was driving up in his Chevy Impala to meet me, like straight off the ferry. He was going to come straight to see me, Jim from New Rochelle. And I was waiting in the parking lot of like Shirley's Hardware, which I think is now like the AMP or something. I don't know, stop and shop. And I hear this like make him, make him, make him clap to this, like as his car is pulling into the parking lot. And I mean, just like the track and oh my God. I mean, I, it's like my heart stopped mm. and I was originally excited to see him. And then I like <laughs> didn't even care anymore. I was like, what is that? What are you listening to? And I just, like, made him play it again and again. I just, like, it blew my mind. And so, I mean, there are many hip-hop records since that have had that effect on me. But that was when I just, it it felt like it just was, like, crackling just through the air. Yeah. Something different. Something rugged. Something fearless and unapologetic. Yes. And I just fell in love with it. Yes, yes, Carrie. I mean, for me, it's so it's so great to listen to you talk about that. But for me, I think it was always a visual enterprise. It was always, I grew up in a Bayesian household, you know, um, and very much in the Cosby era. And so I was surrounded by this vision of blackness, not quite black and chill, Jack and chill, but <laughs> not that respectable, but still very kind of prim. Like Bayesians were not, you know, we're a little, we're a little prissy. And so it was just sort of a quite refined and and reserved sense of blackness was my household version of blackness. And so seeing mm. people in hip hop, seeing rapper was just like, you can be that, you can do that, you can have all of that bravado, all of that swag and all this beauty and make this magic of these sounds. So it was always the image before the music ever made its way into like my heart or my consciousness. It was just being able to see black people that looked more free than any black people mm. I'd ever seen mm. before. Mm. Um, in a time when I was still, you know, getting in trouble if I came home and my braids were messy. <laughs> mm -hmm, right, <laughs> you know, I'd right. never seen anyone be so be so free and and no, you're and, right. The freedom that. Chuck D and LL Cool J and Run and them seemed to have was like, wow. And I think what my parents saw when they saw the Black Panthers running around mm. and they were like, hey, we're not going to do that. But we love them for doing that. And it makes us feel freer to see them do it. And I had that for hip hop and these rappers who were saying crazy things and standing up and being political or being wild. Um, hell yeah. I do remember being in my mom's station wagon with my sister on Route 138, because we were in Boston, and Rapper's Delight came on, and I was about 10, and I was like, what the fuck is that? And I didn't say fuck, because <laughs> I was 10 and my mom was right there, but it was like, what the hell is that? Right. And I feel like we'd heard snippets of people saying things in syncopated ways, but it was like a whole song of that? Right. And the way they flowed, that blew my mind. And I remember also one of my dad's friends saying to me, you haven't heard the message? <laughs> like, oh, what? Wow. And I'm like um, 10 or 11. And it was like, you you have to hear this song. Right. And I was okay, I'll go find that song. And of course, that blew my mind. Okay, mm -hmm. easy questions. Kathy, greatest mm -hmm. rapper of all time, go. Oh, <laughs> my gosh. That's not easy. Um, 
This is what we do, right? In hip hop, <laughs> we sit around. My, my my goat, Lauren Hill. Okay. Yeah. Okay. My goat. Why? I mean, I feel like you know, she's always in the the argument of like the one woman who gets to slide into those lists. Yeah. But I think that like bar for bar, if she had remained consistent with her output, she would smoke all these dudes and like even just some of some of her deepest cuts are some of the best shit that like has sure. ever been written. So. Is yeah, you allude to it. Yeah. Does she really have enough output to be the greatest of all time? We have other people who have stacks and stacks and stacks of of albums and singles and Well, controversial opinion. Biggie had two albums. Yeah. One of them was a double album, but okay. <laughs> I mean, it okay. is. I mean, look, look, look. No, no, no. I, I feel I would, you. I would, I would argue Ralph Ellison, the greatest novelist, of, and no, he's I mean, one, yeah, one. Yeah. So, I, it's, so it's an ari. It's. I possible. mean, I think about like you know, you have the Fuji's. You have two Fuji's albums. Mm -hmm. You have Miseducation. You have the Unplugged, which no matter what people say is a don't is a brilliant <laughs> um, project. You have her collaborations with like Heavy D, Poor Righteous Teachers. All of this work that like people tend to not think about. Okay. I mean. Her verse on Nas's Nobody mm -hmm. that came out, that that alone smoked every verse that came out that year. Okay. They should play it again this year because it'll smoke this year too. Okay. Ugh. All right. Okay. Okay. Jersey. You Greatest know, rep forever. I am not mad at your answer. Mm. I'm really not. Cain and Abel, Caesar and Brutus, Jesus and Judas, backstabbers oh, do this. I mean, come on. You know, like I just think <sighs> yes. like the quality of the bars you know, in the limited amount of output that she has, which yes. I also agree when you talk about Biggie, you know, both friends, love them both. I, I really do think she has to be in the conversation. Biggie is in my conversation. Yes. I'm going to give it to Rakim. I yeah. am just because I feel like he flipped it. He took it from like this sort of syncopated tat, tat, tat that was crazy you know, it was battles, and he started, like, dropping thought-provoking, intricate, weaving into the next phrase with the chill cadence that I believe elevated it to, to like, poetry. Sure. So I'm going to give it to Rakim just sort of because of the inflection point yes. he represents, but— Lauren is in my conversation. Biggie is in my conversation. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm not mad. No, Rakim is absolutely that mm -hmm. inflection point. What is the Led Zeppelin cover, right? Where it's like the light the going prism. in the prism, yeah. and then it's mm -hmm. color, and he is the, the separator. We yeah. were monosyllabic. We were only rhyming on the end of the line. Right. Right. He's internal rhymes. Exactly. He's polysyllabic. Yeah. He is. Extended metaphor. Yes. Yeah. Philosophical. Yeah. He is the beginning of the way we rhyme today. Exactly. Right. And I don't mm. think anybody has been represents a quantum leap forward technically. Yeah. There's mm -hmm. before and after Rakim. Right yes. I think that's that's For why sure. I gotta BR go. and AR. For sure. <laughs> oh. Carrie. I do not have the encyclopedic knowledge, so I'm going to stay off of greatest of all time. I'm just talking about my personal favorite, okay. <laughs> um, which is Bahamadia. I've been obsessed Ooh, with yes. Bahamadia. Amazing voice. Mm -hmm. I mean, the way that she sounds, the way that, to me, she was such a counterpoint to mm -hmm. uh, every time. She's like, that's what's happening in the in the field. I'm going to go over here. I'm going to go do this, whether it was from a technical point of view or lyrically um, or stylistically. And um, I don't think she's gotten enough credit no. um, for her innovations. And mm -hmm. so... I would say she's my favorite. Yeah, incredible yeah. voice. I felt like I had been drawn into her diary. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. And yes, it's a vibe yes. and it's a personal, intimate vibe. And you're rapping just to me. Yes. Right? <laughs> and no, she was dope. She was dope. Okay, so yes, given hip-hop history, duos where there's only two members mm -hmm. are an important part of hip-hop history, and that is different than groups where you have three or more members, okay? So we talk about duos separately than groups. So who is the greatest duo of all time? And when you say duo, are you including like a DJ MC, like an Eric B. and Mark Kim? That's like, a duo. Or a right? gang star? 
Greg Stone is a duo, right? So, right. And we know from from the 80s and the ni- a little bit in the 90s, but like sometimes it was two rappers, a PMD. Sometimes right, yeah. it was a rapper and a DJ, but like Eric B and Rakim were like a unit, right? right. They were one. Okay, right? so Gangsta- you, a unit of two, no matter yes. whether it's MC, yeah. DJ, yes, cause or. The, t- yes, because the producer, premier, sure. whoever is just as important, right? We love Gangstar yeah. for both of them. We love Pete mm-hmm. Rock and Seal Smooth for both of them, mm-hmm. right? So, right, I'm not going to say. Tribe Called Quest is a duo because because no. Ali never rhymed like that's right. a trio. Oh yeah, for right? sure. The right so yeah. so yes. Any any and whatever the other person does, they can be a rapper, they can be a producer, DJ, whatever. Hmm. Right. Wow. Okay. Am I open? I'm again? like waiting I don't for know. like Drew's I know. answer. I, I'm just I, like. I mean, you know, I I mean, you mentioned some that I love Pete Rock and Seal Smooth. I'm I, I'm gonna go Gangstar. I just because yeah. Primo. I mean, just. Mm. You know, Keith, killer, just insane. Yeah. You know, the chill, the chill tone, the jazz. Yes. I think they also represent an important inflection point. There were some fun duos, but I feel like they were kind of like serious. Yes. Even though like Blue Note inspired covers. Sure. So, I mean, not always, but the Jasmine's has for sure. Mm. And just the impact of Primo. Yeah. So mm. I'm, I'm going to, I just feel like impactful duo Personal fave, but also impact. I'm gonna give it to Gangstar. I mean, Guru was a genius yeah. musician, and the way he would flow sort of behind the beat yes. and like mm. off kilter flows yes. on purpose. I'm like you're a genius. Also yeah. opening the door for that to be a thing. Yes. Mm. You know, I yes. mean, yeah. And one of those voices where you could read the phone book and yeah. it would be good, yeah. <laughs> right? Yes. Right. Kathy. Um, outcast. For sure. Mm. Yeah. For sure. Because, I, I mean, Andre 3000 is, like, right there with Lauren Hill with me. My my Instagram handle is Kat3000 for yes. that reason. I, I took his last name. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> so he's your husband. <laughs> I mean, if he's if he's yeah. available. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, I love the yin and yang mm. of um, oh, Andre yeah. and Big Boy. I mean, that, them together, like... Very rarely do you get to have that balance of like this. Well, actually, Eric B and Rakim kind of had that same balance of like the super swaggy guy and then like the really pensive one, right? Uh-huh. Like so, uh-huh. there is a balance mm-hmm. to that. Um, but the two of them, they just were incredible together mm-hmm. and incredible apart. But yeah, no, I mean, I mean, an incredible catalog yeah. and the soulfulness yeah. of their music. It's all incredible. Yeah. Greatest and the duo? expansiveness. I mean, I was going to yeah. say Outcast as sure. well because, I mean, the the range. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Duo is relatively easy. Most people say Outcast. Gangstar is a great, mm-hmm. great choice. Group is much harder. <laughs> Group is much yeah. harder. Three or more members. Mm. So Ooh. anywhere from Tribe Called Quest to Wu Tang. Mm. Jeez. Who's the greatest group of all time, Kathy? Wu Tang. Yeah, I gotta give it to the Wu. Yeah. I mean, I and ironically, my favorite uh, member of Wu Tang Clan is Master Killer. Okay. Why ironically? Because everyone kind of like laughs at me about that because like <laughs> when you think about how Wu Tang, you know, when when they were in the studio mm-hmm. and having to go in and fight for their bars and mm-hmm. you know, Master Killer was only on the album once. Um but No Said Date was still one of my favorite albums, his solo work. But I think that just um, the way they all were like pieces of a puzzle, mm-hmm. like a very beautiful puzzle. Um, I don't know. That, that For me, it's it's it has always been Wu-Tang. Mm. True. You know, I want to be more clever here, but I just, if I'm being honest, it's Tribe. I love Tribe. Absolutely love Tribe. Signed tip because I love Tribe. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I loved that they, again, the jazz, the musicality, the yin and yang, you know, of the the comedy of Fife and then Tip's unmistakable style, voice, cadence, mm. um, a little bit of righteousness, a lot of fun, you know, uh, uplifting but not preachy. I mean, you know, P.E.'s got to be in the conversation sure, I absolutely, think yeah. absolutely. I think we're swinging very east coast heavy I mean you know there's there's west coast groups there's I mean we got outcast in we've got the south <laughs> has something to say for sure but um for me I just love tribe I mean you know I am 
I was in Jack and Jill against my will. <laughs> but Weren't I we all? Jack and Jill. Um, you know, private school, right? Uh, Suburbs. Yeah. Um, before I get to the point of that, the journey of Fife from mm. first album to second, third album, mm. and how he was kind of just hanging out the yeah. first album. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then he gets serious about mm-hmm. emceeing in the group, and the second album is like, oh my God, like, yeah. you know, most improved player of the year. And the third album, <laughs> right. like, holy shit, it's not just Tip and the Pips. Fucking Fife is incredible. Yeah. Yeah. And obviously, Ollie was always incredible. But as a suburban kid, De La Soul, mm. like, I was like, that's who I would be if I could <laughs> rap. Right. Right. Like I would be. And I felt validated as like I felt like before them, I was always like, I love this stuff. I love Kane. I love Slick Rick. Right. Mm. I love LL. But I didn't realize I felt at arm's reach from them. And De La Mm -hmm. Soul was like, oh, my God, you guys are like in the car with me. Like I am like, you're my brother. Right. Like, you know, and they're even like on the second album when they're talking about fighting, mm-hmm. they're talking mm-hmm. about just because we're from the suburbs doesn't mean we're soft. Right. Right? right. Which is what the working class is always like. You're suburbs. You're soft. Right. right. No. So I I love them and their music and their rhymes and their journey. And I love them to death. You're great. The greatest group of all time. Karen. I mean, I don't know if they're the greatest group of all time. Again, not qualified to actually you take qualified. that assessment. You're no, qualified because no, you're a hip-hop not. fan. Yeah. And therefore, I know how much other people know. <laughs> I um, helped interview both of these women. So i um, very aware of how much more they know than I do. Um, but, you know, my background's in politics. I'm a political animal. I see everything from a political lens. And for that reason, Public Enemy mm. dr- was the soundtrack to a radical yeah. shift in public consciousness yeah. um, and in black consciousness of the last two generations, however we want to define those generations, three generations maybe, and um, put words and dialogue into the lexicon of American race relations, American mm-hmm. politics, American sure. uh, the security state, the police state, yeah. drew very important lines around within the black community around sort of how we were identifying and relating to those same set of issues. And I don't know... I did not listen to them as the most <laughs> growing up, right? I probably would have listened to Tribe more or even De La, but when I think about the impact, the, the world that I'm living in now, yeah. I see, I most directly see the line from Public Enemy to, um, who, to who I am and oh, to yeah. ha- my understanding of the world. And I'm not going to say this is a personal fave, although I did love it, even though I knew I shouldn't have loved it. I think we just have to acknowledge the impact of NWA. Yeah. yeah. Sure. I mean, mm-hmm. I think we do. If we're going to yeah. talk about just mm-hmm. juggernauts, you yeah. know, like sure. they were the Beatles kind of like sure. in terms of mm. their impact. And sure. so just, yeah, just want to say the word. Enemy meant a lot to my personal maturation of like growing up, reading different things. And they were an analog to, okay, you're reading France Fanon, whatever, you know, you're reading Malcolm X. And they are doing the same thing sonically. Yeah. And one thing, Minister Farrakhan could not get on television in the late 80s. He was shadow banned from Mm. television. So my consciousness of him was very low. And Chuck kept talking about Mm. him, Mm. which made me go, who is this person he keeps Mm. mentioning? And not in a, you should listen to Farrakhan. He just blah, 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 Farrakhan. And I'm like, who is he? Yeah. And, you know, for, for better, for worse, all the things. It's like I have to I have to study who this person is. So Chuck is teaching me, you know, yeah, ideas absolutely. and people and all these sort of things. And it, I, so many cultural products and cultural creators and people who determine the world we live in exist on a spectrum between consciousness raising and coalition building. And mm-hmm. there's value in all of it. Um, and there are bands and there are groups and uh, MCs, writers, authors, so on that raise consciousness about what has happened to us, yes. right? And tell you what has happened to you. And then there's also artists that bring more people into the conversation yes. about where we are, who we are, and where we've been. And they, to me, did both, which is extraordinarily mm. difficult and mm-hmm. rare when it comes to an artist being able to be both specific but also so expansive to really let people know something 
really wild <laughs> and horrible has happened is happening. And I'm going to bring so many additional people into that conversation and bring you to yeah. so many additional people. Chuck was really important for hip hop in general because we were rising. Mm -hmm. There was a large contingent of America that was like, we're scared of hip hop. Mm -hmm. And a lot of rappers were not able to go on television and explain themselves. Mm -hmm. yeah. And different things happened out mm -hmm. on the road to Run DMC and others, mm -hmm. and they were not able to talk to media in the way that Chuck was able to go on Nightline or go yep. on some show mm -hmm. and explain. And he, he almost became like the senator representing hip hop. Yeah. Because yes. he could come out and like explain in a way, look, Ted Koppel, this is the way we see it. <laughs> right. And mm -hmm. I'm not backing down mm -hmm. to you. And it was this very powerful media presentation that was super important. And the yin and the yang of Flav mm -hmm. for the comic relief. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Chuck. I mean, it wouldn't have worked really if it was just all medicine. You know, so he it's was true. like the God, chaser. Hank Shockley said Flavor was the most important person in the group. I'm like, no, no, Chuck is. He's like, no, for what you said, Flavor, because he added that other element. He made it entertainment. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Records. Like you could hear it again and again because he was, yeah, boy, like that <laughs> made it like you could handle it. He was know? the candy where you had the vitamin. Yes, yeah, exactly. hell yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Sorry. So greatest female rapper, you already said. Can I, Kathy can I add Lauren. another one? Absolutely. Okay. I mean, um, okay. Now, oh, now the pressure. Okay. So um, is Lauren remaining one and you're adding two or you're adding a co number I, one? Well, I think Lauren is in, there's, I think there's two categories, right? Okay. I think Lauren transcends that category in my opinion because of the goat and then broken down okay. further. Okay. I'm going to say Eve. Hmm. Eve is yeah. your group. My favorite Eve. female rapper, yeah. Okay. Yeah, because... <laughs> I'm sorry, Eve? Why are you laughing? I'm not laughing. <laughs> I'm surprised that you have leapt over so many other people to grab Eve. Well, if you're talking about an artist where who's an amalgam of all the things that um, embody what it is to be um, a female rapper okay. by... Yesterday's standards, today's standards, hopefully tomorrow's standards, I think it's her. Okay. Because I think she incorporates the lyrics. She incorporates the sexiness, sexiness, sexiness. Mm -hmm. She um she incorporates the ability to be mainstream, mm -hmm. but then also create like underground. Like, I mean, I I always like from the first album, that was like um, a perfect example of um a female rapper to mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, in terms of like you know, I mean, and this this is where it gets hard because if you're saying like the greatest male rapper, you're always like, well, what in terms of what lyricism, the ability to make a hit, well, how they the work with the producer, all the things, all the right? Things. But I couldn't answer that question for a guy, so it's actually okay. hard to answer it for a girl. But for me, if I'm if you're taking ooh, if you're taking all of the the qualities and putting it into one artist, I'd pick Eve. Okay, Carrie. I mean, now I feel like it's my turn to say Lauren. For the reasons more. of, again, to make it a political and social exercise. <laughs> because I think that Lauren really kind of single-handedly for her era had an impact around reshaping the role of black women in public consciousness. Yes. Mm -hmm. That was the, not the anti-Claire Huxtable, but mm -hmm. a much different and more expansive and broader, but no less... Mm -hmm intriguing, powerful, dynamic, kind of positive, um, positive without being Pollyanna or being um, being a facade. And um, I think as a black woman coming of age when miseducation came mm -hmm. out, it's probably 17, 16, 17, 18, something like mm -hmm. that. And, and then how, I, I mean, I remember my experience of how I was received in the world pre and post that album mm -hmm. and pre and post her album covers. You and think that, that miseducation changed how you were, Carrie, were perceived in the world? Yeah, I think it changed oh. the way that me and my friends as black women, when we showed up in Saks, when we showed up in at mm. universities, when we showed up at jobs, wow. mm. I think she was a frame of reference for 
the broader American consciousness. And she made incredible music, right? Sure. And mm -hmm. she was extraordinarily talented. But For I sure. think she created a um, she created cultural space and social space for Black women to show up with a lot more agency. For sure. Um, and I palpably felt that in my life. I'm surprised that you said Lauren as opposed to Claire Huxtable versus, say, Lauren, or I thought you were going as opposed to Foxy and Kim, who were, like, perhaps the way that the men would want the women mm. to come in to this room versus Lauren, who clearly all women are like, be a, in, a, in a world of Kim's, be a Lauren, right? <laughs> well, I'm... Go ahead, Kathy. No, Tell I me mean, I'm wrong. don't say in a world of Kim's be a Lauren. I mean, the, the, in a world of Kim's and Lauren's be yourself. Like you know. Well, you know, you know what I mean. I mean, would, would you? Would you? I mean, would you not want your daughter, if you had a daughter, mm -hmm. um, to be more Lauren than Kim? I would want my daughter to be whoever she wanted to be. I mean, I don't. I don't know. I mean. You're also talking to the co-author of Lil' Kim's book, so I'm just kind of like, I don't know. I, I mean, I'm in terms of like— I'm not specifically attacking Kim. Well, I mean, I think I think what—I think the thing is, and this is where we get in the weeds of talking about female rappers, right? In terms of like, you know, that's like saying—that is just—that's just as productive as saying, well, I want to be Jay-Z, and you saying, so you want to be a former drug dealer? Like, you can't—you can't—that that narrative kind of— minimizes the impact of what the what women did because also like with little kim little kim's the reason why there are so many different women on runways now in fashion shows and why rappers are on the runway it's because of little kim so if we're going to look it through the lens of what the bedroom antics yeah no i don't want my daughter like talking about how she used to be scared of the dick but I want my daughter to, if she wants to be part of high fashion and she's only four foot nine, yeah, I want her to do that. For sure. For sure. I mean, I'm going to come back to you on a greatest rap, greatest female rapper, because we're because we're drilling down to something that we started talking about before. Right. I think a lot of female rappers, because they entered this misogynist boys club space that hip hop is, that they are constructed either by external forces or that they understand how do I succeed here by accommodating the male gaze, Yeah. right? And I think Lauren, I think where I was going with that, Lauren is somebody who does not seem to be doing that at all. Mm -hmm. mm. And I think, okay, well, you no, can- No, 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 I'm sorry, I didn't interrupt. No, no, you can educate me, uh, professor. Uh, but, but I think <laughs> that there are many other female rappers who are accommodating the male gaze. And I think you agree with me, Drew. Yes, I do want to say something, though. I don't think hip-hop is the misogynist problem. It's capitalism. Mm -hmm. It's America. Okay. Mm -hmm. So let's not single hip-hop out. Yeah. So anyone entering the arena of capitalism, certainly entertainment and capitalism, is entering a misogynist arena where the gatekeepers are men mm -hmm. and where we have discovered in hip-hop mm -hmm. that many of the male gatekeepers are toxic. Mm -hmm. Of course. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the women who are gatekeepers in hip-hop are enablers of toxic mm. men. Mm. And so mm. if you look at that and you fast forward 10, 20, 30, 50 years, you start to filter out women who are not accommodating the male gaze and yeah. you favor women who are. Right. And I think we are looking at the result of women gatekeepers, women A&R people, myself included, being pushed out of the industry and the survivors are toxic men or not toxic men, but those who enable them and women who enable them as well. Mm. And the women who get to make it, the women who survive, and the male artists, to your phenomenal tweet, nobody's wrapping the Bible here. So let's not pick on the women. Not that the Bible's yeah. even the answer in the first sure. place. Right. <laughs> but your point was well taken on Twitter.com because I'm not calling it X. Um, <laughs> but... You know, I do think that at some point we are going to have to grapple with the fact that the king of the whole entire thing turned out to be as toxic mm. as he is. For sure. And the fact that his rib was essentially taken to build Diddy, Jay-Z, yeah. mm. everybody else. Yeah. What did that do to the DNA of this whole beautiful culture? Yeah. And I think we are looking at the result of that choice and that dynamic. And so 
I will circle back to the original question. I've already said Lauren as somebody who needs to be in the conversation yeah. overall. Yeah. I agree with you. Yeah. So I'm going to go Missy. I'm just going to put mm, Missy yeah. in the discussion. Impact, ill rhymes, ill presentation, ill flow, crazy sense of theater, visual yes. presentation, performance, and a producer, like a killer producer. Killer producer. And mm -hmm. impact, just insane impact. Also, never accommodating the male gaze. Right. And, yeah. and right. you know, I also think we have to talk about Lauren and Missy transcending in a colorist society as well. Mm. So mm -hmm. huge, hugely important. And so I'm going to just put Missy's name in the conversation. So you don't? think that a lot of these female rappers are accommodating the male gaze and that is no, not I meant wouldn't. to be a critique of them but how do i get into a space where i mean uh, drew you uh, for i've been in the industry the overwhelming the audience is overwhelmingly young men right i'm not sure what the demographics are of purchases but yes, I don't know if that's actually true. I, I think it may be more true. split. Yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. the consumers are- Not overwhelming. I yeah. think the consumers may skew more female, yeah. actually. Really? Mm -hmm. But the gatekeepers are overwhelming. The gatekeepers men. for sure. But in terms, see, I think the thing is like, we have to be aware of what we're considering to be the male gaze or a woman embodying her own sexiness. Because I will never forget Lauren Hill's Details magazine cover. She was painted in gold. She had on red shorts and a black top. She just had her baby and she had her curves and she wanted to feel sexy. And she was slammed for that cover mm -hmm. because they were like, oh, so now this is, this is where you're going. You're going, you're going the Kim and Foxy route. And she was just like, I never had hips before. I never had breasts before. I did the Details magazine cover and this is what I wore. And she was dragged for it. So I think, I think the thing is to bring it to the present, I think we don't know what we're dividing and conquering here when a woman is looking in the mirror and thinking she's feeling sexy. Is she feeling sexy for herself? Is she feeling sexy for other women? Is she feeling sexy for, for men? I don't know what the gaze actually is right now. I also want to introduce that I... The young women that you see today, you know, there there is an accommodation and covering up as well, right? Yeah. In, in saying, I won't show my body, I won't wear makeup, I won't look a certain way because mm -hmm. I don't want to be judged as less than. I don't want to be – like, mm -hmm. when I worked at the White House, I never wore makeup. Never. Wow. And because I want to be taken seriously. Mm. And if someone thinks that I want to, I care more about my presentation, then they wouldn't take me seriously. And that's not, that's something I projected onto them. No one had ever said that, but it's part of the culture. And so I think to say that it's only the women who are scantily clad right. are the ones that are accommodating a, a, a male gaze or male, uh, we're, we're trying to anticipate the way we will be treated by men is a false concept. I think right. that is half of of the reality yeah. of what being in a woman's body is. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm seeing from the young people <laughs> sounds so <laughs> old. <laughs> but what I what, when I when I see these 21-year-olds, yeah. right, who are very young, um, but are adults and and I think they are treating both respectability politics, the idea that they have to be taken seriously, and the objectification. They're not the only naked person in the room. They're not right. the only right. borderline naked person in the room. So it doesn't carry the same weight for people who did not grow up seeing every single person on the street in yoga pants, yeah. right? Like we did not see people dressed the way mm -hmm. they they do now, their generation does now. <laughs> Again, sounding ancient, but. <laughs> You're fine. Um, so I don't know that they think about it in the same way. And when we were doing all these interviews for Ladies First, they, mm -hmm. their their lens on it is fundamentally different. Yeah. They're not mm -hmm. they're not thinking that if they dress this way, they're gonna get a bunch of press attention. Yeah. Or they're gonna get more like the How girls on the see? street are How less. Are they yeah, they don't. They're doing their thing, right? They're like, I could show yeah. up on the street and I'm not going to be a standout. I'm not going to be out of step with 100%. my peers. Um, and so they're not under, they're not, um, imagining that they're going to get this outsized attention that perhaps we confer on them. Yeah. I think that's a great point. And again, it's like the problem is the patriarchy. 100%. Like Claire Huxtable, since she's getting a lot of burn in this conversation, <laughs> doesn't dress anything like Coyle Ray or Little Kim, but is she free? I mean, is, mm. she, is whatever she represents truly free? 
a free person. Right. I mean, we're all sort of accommodating the patriarchal gaze and evaluation. We're just playing it differently. Mm-hmm. Yes. But we're all having to play it somehow because it's oppressive. Um, right. Absolutely. And it's, it's ubiquitous. And the comparison I was drawing between the two of them, between Lauren Hill and Claire Huxtable, wasn't it was that Lauren again seemed free. She seemed she was yeah. a black woman who had so much agency in a way that to me, Kim never struck me as someone who had as much agency. Mm. And that was my projection onto her. I'm not right. trying to speak to her motivation or what her lived experience was, mm-hmm. but she seemed much more in response. Her identity seemed in response and in relief to what was around her, whether Mm. it was Biggie, whether it was fashion, whether it was, you know, these photographers or who she wanted to be or what have you. And Lauren just seemed like such a self-contained being in a way that was, um, she also was the, you know, she was America's like girl next door for a minute. You know, there was that era. She got rid of that though. Yes, she did. <laughs> but also in retrospect, she was also in pain. Yeah. yeah. In retrospect, pain. that album was really about abuse. It was Absolutely. it was about a kind, a Kevin different unplugged. kind of abuse. I mean, it was. Yeah. And so is she really any different from Kim? I mean, in the sense that right. they're all wrestling with this paradigm of male dominance, male abuse of, you know, affection, yep. love, you know— intimacy, sexuality. And so I think it's a trick. And so I think you're right to push back on the notion that we're sort of indicting these more recent sort of versions of what empowerment looks like, because I think we're all fighting to figure out how can you show up as an empowered woman in a world where, I mean, the, you know, we got the candidate Top candidate for president, grabbing women by the pussy. 100%. Roe v. Wade rolled back. You know, I mean, so we're not free. So what? it doesn't matter what we wear. We can be on a pole. What? Literally. Literally. We ain't free. It's so, I mean, exactly. Let's build on this for a second because I can't imagine what it would be like if hip hop was the thing I loved Mm -hmm. and it was a bunch of white men talking about niggers all the time. But that's what you guys have to live through, that you love it. And the men you love and respect are making it, and they're saying bitch and ho all the time and telling stories about the things they did with da, 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 whatever. And I know a lot of women in my life have talked about they had to listen around that and to deal with the pain or the sense of exclusion from that. Um, and sort of like listening to it of like, oh, I gotta roll my eyes. But if you complained every time a rapper said bitch, like, I don't know, you'd either not listen to it or you sound like a crank, right? Or Dionne Warwick or something. Like, is that been something, Kathy, that has been like, I'm listening to this, but it, they are making it hard? I mean, you can walk to any path station in New York City and hear what every man rapping is saying to you. I mean, I walk, you walk down the street and you're getting the same things that rappers are saying. So it's like, as a woman, you walk past a construction you choose, site you and you're being— you choose to press play on whoever, Slick Rick, Biggie, I also whoever. choose to walk down the street. I could just hide in my house if I don't want to be insulted by men. I really edit. I mean, I hear <laughs> you, but, like, I almost exclusively listen to women. Really? Yeah, I've quit list. There are things I yeah. won't have listened to for a few years. And I'll put it on. It's just like I don't need yeah. to be called names. So like I don't need my my. So that is that that alone cuts you off from certain rappers of like I I don't need that. Well, part of it's partly the language, but really it's about what the lang. It's about the power of the language and the lack of accountability for how powerful these men are in this industry and mm. in this art form is, and the fact that. We still have black women that get dramatically worse medical outcomes Mm -hmm. that you have Mm -hmm. doctors at Johns Hopkins thinking that black people have extra muscles and extra bones Mm -hmm. that you, Mm -hmm. I mean, there are real world consequences to Mm -hmm. how we exist in the public imagination. And it's really difficult to 
listen to things where I don't feel, and it's not necessarily their job, right? It's not mm. their job to think about the consequences of the words that come out of their mouth. They can make whatever art they want. I believe that. Mm. I don't have to participate in that. Right. Mm. So for me, I choose not to participate in in art forms of all kinds that right. I don't think are constructive or useful or helpful and um yeah I would say that before I was healed I didn't really find it offensive because I was trauma bonded to mm. hip hop wow. I was trauma bonded to toxic patriarchy mm. it's all I'd ever known in my life and so I'd learn to just override the red flags I turned the danger music all the way down yeah. and just walked right into the shark's mouth. And, you know, I, the love that I had for it, it was really a trauma bond. Mm. And I had to leave the industry because it hurt me in so many ways, some very big and well-known ways and other smaller ways. And the more I heal, the more I really can't tolerate it. And, um, you know, I listen to scores, you know, I, mm. I just, I'm, I'm just too healthy now. Mm. to take it in. And so I think the fact that so many women, and in particular so many black women and girls love hip hop, it's a trauma bond. I think it speaks mm. to how deeply wounded we are. I go back to where I began from the transatlantic slave trade where every black woman and girl was raped. Mm. And every man who defended her, every black man who defended her was placed in a cell to die. And we have not solved for that yet. We are now running that cycle on a repeat, and they don't even have to be involved anymore. And we have made music that embodies that same cycle. And we have to heal. I mean, I am healing as a person. I'm healing in a public way in some ways because I came forward and said me too and have had to heal in a very public way that may have seemed way better looking at it from the outside in, but I promise you behind closed doors, it brought me to my knees. I had mm. to make peace with the victim and all of that stuff and a lot of self-loathing in there. But on the other side of it, my heart breaks, not just for my younger self, but for all of my sisters mm. and my entire community. I just want us to be healthier and freer. And um, so, yeah, it's painful. You blew my mind when you started talking about your healing journey and at a certain point you were like i'm able to write again mm. and i hadn't been able to write songs and poetry mm. for a long time and when i dealt with that mm. my creative side yeah. started to come mm. back wow. yeah and i was like wow yeah yeah i mean it's i mean this is years before i publicly came forward i was healing privately in therapy and dealing with a lot of the trauma. And when I s sort of had like a breakthrough, I, I wrote like an, a whole entire song um, called Favorite Doll that interestingly, old Kanye loved. <laughs> um, oh. But it was almost like an out of body experience. Like this part of me that was locked in an attic mm -hmm. started to show up again. And the healing is integrating that part of yourself. And my hope for hip hop in the next 50 years is that we can be a healed version of an unapologetic, mm -hmm. rebellious, mm -hmm. confident, you know, genius, innovative, endlessly creative, fearless force. Mm -hmm. And that healing becomes part of that force and part of that power. Mm. And I believe we're capable of it. I mean, I still love hip hop and I believe in the endless innovation of our people and all of the people of all races and gender identities that make up the hip hop community 50 years later. And I hope that we can level up. I would love that. I don't know if I have that optimism. I look at yeah. R&B and soul music and I see emotional awareness right, mm. which we typically associate mm. with women. And I look at the whole of hip hop and I see a complete lack of mm. emotional awareness and generally a lack of wanting to 
look deeply at oneself and be critical of oneself, right? Mm -hmm. It's very masculine. I'm the shit. I think the the thesis of most hip hop songs is I'm the shit, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And and so the notion that like that R and B could do that could how have we treated women and like come something new? I don't know that hip hop has that in it. So let me ask you though: Do you consider the weekend to be R and B music or SZA? Is the weekend R and B in um, your eyes? Yeah, as opposed to what pop? Well. I mean, as opposed I, to hip hop. Yeah, I was actually because because the reason why I'm asking when you're saying that coming from a place of like having that healing, the first time that I have been like kind of like ugh by lyrics and I, and you know you said something I keep running into my microphone you said something <laughs> about the trauma bond to hip hop and I feel like you know at my big age it's like I'm starting to like acknowledge that trauma bond, mm. but the moment that in recent weeks. Recent, it, it happened my last class that I taught. NYU. At NYU. I was playing a song for my kids. Um, we were like analyzing it or whatever. And it was uh, The weekend's Heartless. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he says, never need a bitch. I'm what a bitch needs. Trying to find the one that can fix me. And I got, and I go, I just like out loud. I'm like, Jesus. I go like that. Like, and I. And I caught myself being so much like, is he serious? That's why I was asking because he's an R&B singer. Yeah. And if he, if he was, you know, it, 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 it was almost as if it had to hit me from a different medium mm. Mm. for me to be like, oh, let me push the plate away. Mm. Um, mm. That and that it was last Tuesday. <laughs> mm. So. I Past guess, Tuesday, actually. The thing is, the reason I say I believe in hip hop's potential is because I'm not conflating hip hop with the music industry. Okay. Ooh. So the music industry is a problem. Yeah. It's just a problem. Yeah. Um, it's an exploitative model, and it has rewarded and promoted people that don't care about mm -hmm. the consequences. So again, the artists don't have to care; they can express their art. But somebody has to make choices about curation. Mm -hmm. I mean, they are curating the culture. And the people who have been elevated don't care. And so, you know, the question is, do we displace them? Do we go around them? Does the internet give us an opportunity somehow? I mean, the internet is on some level kind of democratizing access, but it's also created so much clutter that you kind of go back to the labels because you, you do mm -hmm. need gatekeepers. Mm -hmm. You do need curators. But I guess what I'm saying is my faith isn't in the industry. My faith is in the artists and the artistry. Mm. And so the question is, how do you put the microphone and the budget and the spotlight in the hands and on the artists who are saying these things? Because I promise you, there are people out there, there are young artists out there who are writing revolutionary rhymes Absolutely. and lyrics yeah. that are uplifting that are in therapy or that have been through some crazy shit in their families and have had to read a book or two or three or watch a youtube video and have thought about these things they read bell hooks they did something yeah. they are out there but we don't have people in positions of power who care anymore like my mm. little self and my little job tried to find the interlude or the artist that was doing that and I tried to like hold the door open for that moment because I cared but I don't think anyone cares anymore See, yeah, we needed somebody you are the A&R person who is the reason why we have you're all I need yeah Mary mm -hmm. and meth one of the great songs of hip-hop history and one of the songs in hip-hop that deals with emotion yeah. and love vulnerability. at a deep vulnerability yeah. at a deep level. And Jay-Z's done it with Song Cry. There's a couple examples, but like that's R&B. R&B does that mm -hmm. all day long, right? And hip hop generally doesn't do that. Um, you, Kathy, you had an interesting breakdown earlier because there are more successful female rappers now right. than there ever have been. And I was trying to think through, where does this come from? Because yeah. the labels are not doing it to be altruistic, right? Right. And I don't know, has the audience changed? Like, what? What is the? You know, we 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 see like tons of groups coming out right. of Seattle now. Like, well, you know, Nirvana blew up, so yeah. they all ran to Seattle. I remember when um, there was one when after Snoop. And I was actually, I was trying to get Lior on the phone for something. And he was like, oh, I have to go. I have to fly to Long Beach 
and right away to see how many other great rappers there are from Long Beach. Like, oh right. my God. Okay. So what is it? So, so there are things that drive certain trends in the industry. Well, the one thing that, you know, we, we hadn't discussed prior is um, I think there's like a huge lack of artist development. So it's mm. well, so sure. you're able to sign and fast track an artist and their first single a lot faster. Mm. And what's happening now is there's not a huge investment in the women that they're pushing. There's a huge investment in the one song that's going to break. So you're seeing a lot of you're seeing tens of women with one really hot song mm -hmm. and the hope that there's a second, third and fourth. And that's that's been proven true for a bunch of the women. The It remains to be told for the others. But I think what's happening now is like record labels are making it a point to be like, hey, we had a Nikki, let's get three Nikki's. Or what happens if we get four Cardi's? What is what, what, what can that look like? And I think that if that mindset would have just been part of the 90s, it might have been an entirely different set of circumstances mm -hmm. if, you know, I'll never forget in my book, Rodiga had said that um, back then it was like the breakdown of the sex kittens versus the Nubian goddesses. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And she said you either fell into one or the other. Yeah. I think if the if the um, the music industry found a way to go down the middle. And that's why when you said to me that my like my favorite female hip hop artist, that's why I said Eve. I think she went she goes the down middle. the middle. Mm -hmm. And I think if we had enough of down the middle artists who can possess everything that women love about being a woman and then everything men love about being a woman, we wouldn't be so shocked when it it only goes by what men love about a woman. Mm. You know what I mean? Or even when what women love about a woman, sometimes there's a lot of music that some men are like, I can't listen to that. And I'm like, oh, poor you, right? Mm -hmm. But if we were able to go down that middle road. Now today, you're seeing 30, 40 women getting signed for their one song. And you were saying that it's not the success of Nikki that they responded to. It's the success of... Cardi and Megan the yeah, Stallion as, that they responded to. As soon as they saw that you can have artist after artist breaking, because remember, everyone always... So, so you're saying Nikki seemed like an anomaly, but then Cardi and Megan was like, no, it's not an anomaly. It's not an anomaly. This is something that's happening. Because remember, everyone, the thing that always makes me laugh is when they said that like Nicki Minaj came off a 10-year dry spell since Miss Education Lauren Hill. That couldn't be further from the truth. In the 10 years between the Miss Education Lauren Hill and the arrival of Nicki Minaj, we still had albums from Missy Elliott. We still had albums from Lil' Kim. We still had albums from Eve, Remy Ma, Trina. The problem was the label stopped investing in signing new women. So any woman who before BL, before Lauren, right? Right? Any woman who came before Lauren was able to get in and stay in, but they weren't investing in anyone new. The first person, the first woman that was invested in was Nicki Minaj. Mm -hmm. And they waited 10 more years to invest in Cardi B. But once the investment went from Cardi B to Megan, to Lotto, to Koi, all of a sudden it's like, oh, wait a minute. This is happening. Maybe if we diversify our portfolio, we can build a movement. And that's what's happening now. So you are getting penny stocks, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but then you are getting investments in Apple or Amazon too. Like you're getting big investments and then you're just getting really small investments. And I just hope that a couple years from now, we're not going to look back on this era like we did on more recently mumble rap or the drill rap scene. I don't want to look back on this five years from now and be like, remember the women rap scene? Because that mm. would crush me. Mm. Like that, and, yeah. and I would hate for it to be because women talked about their bodies too much. That, for me, if we can figure it out now, we're women, we know what we're doing. If we can figure that shit out now so that it's not relegated to a trend and an era, that would make me so happy. I would add a couple things to that, though. One is that you see black women overperforming mm. in multiple industries. We have the most college degrees of any mm -hmm. demographic. We're starting more businesses, mm -hmm. more promotions, more running for office, higher voting numbers. Like by every kind of mm -hmm. metric, black women over index relative to their demographic. Um, and I don't think that music and the and rappers are any different from that. I think you have a democratization of access mm. through the internet, through social media, where 
these kids have grown up with these tools, are incredibly savvy mm -hmm. on how to actually build an audience, how to package themselves, how to brand themselves, how to create a public-facing version of themselves, as well as then having talent. They know how to build an audience, and they're just on it, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and I think all of that contributes to what we're seeing right now in addition to everything that Kathy just laid out. Uh, so I, it's, I think it's a, there's a meta – Mm. narrative there's a meta movement that's happening i think for black women in this moment that it's you can you can see been, in many places that okay. i've been um just sort of rolling around for a while and maybe you'll violently disagree with me but um, <laughs> looking right i think at me. that um i think that when i look at the overall uh conversation that male rappers have been having for years mm -hmm. i get a part of the vision of what's going on for black America. And I don't feel like the women rappers are, because there are fewer and for many other reasons, I, am I getting a full, or, a full or partial picture of like what their lives are like in this world? And I think, for example, of uh, Alicia Keys doing Fallen and mm -hmm. like, all these men who in public space talked about, here's what it's like to go to prison or be in and out of prison or have my dad in prison. And here's a woman saying, here, at least visually, here's what it's like to be the wife or girlfriend mm. of someone in prison. Okay. Mm -hmm. Are my, and I'm like, I don't know of female rappers who are talking about that and the way that I see, you know, even I think a song like Trap Queen, and he's like, I'm a thug <laughs> in the street. And I want a girl who's there with me, right? To yeah. the same shit. I'm like, are, are women being allowed or able to have that conversation? Not just about the street, mm -hmm. but just, you know, I'm saying you're, mm -hmm. the men are able to paint a fuller, not complete, but a fuller picture of what it is to be a man. Like from, a thesis. They like get to have thesis a thesis. From NWA's vision of it mm -hmm. to Luke's vision of it to Tribe and Dela's vision of it. Mm -hmm. Are I, women yeah. able and allowed to do the same thing? I want to build on your meta dynamic com comment in the same way that women, black women, founders don't get funded. I'm going to go back to black female artists, female artists, period. Don't get the budgets and the room and the mm. canvas and the opportunity to fail mm. in order to have a thesis, yeah. in order to have the kind of body of work that gets you a Pulitzer, right? Mm. Mm -hmm. You need the room and the artist so development true. and the support so to make Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, fifteen, sixteen mm. songs, mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. and to have a story and a thesis, and then to fail, and then to put it all together. And if you only get so a budget true. for one record, you gotta just hit it and quit yeah. it. And so it's like it's the self fulfilling narrative. Like, you know, I, I think about like the miseducation. I think about Lemonade, right? Yeah. Like. Beyonce got to make Lemonade because she was Beyonce. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Lauren got to make The Miseducation because she was coming off of the goddamn score. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But other than that, I mean, yeah, I got to go back to Nina Simone, maybe Tina Turner. Like, what's love got to do with so it? True. Like, the window, like, the number of stars that have to align yeah. for a black female recording artist to get the room to make a thesis album so it's true. like it doesn't happen. They get a they get a budget for a song. Do, do so women true. artists typically get lower budgets than the male artists you who know, are like in the same lane? I'm gonna say I think so. Yeah, yeah. from what so. we heard, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, they definitely do. Because, I would, yeah, sorry, no, just to put to get them on a stage costs more money mm -hmm. because um, the Trina talks about this at great length, where um, especially during the Napster era when she was, you know, trying to tour, when the, um, you know, RIAA like came crashing down or whatever, they wouldn't tour her. And she's like, why? I'll get someone to do my hair. And it's like, it's not going to look good enough. So it's like, you're too expensive to put on a stage, but we can put a guy on stage in sweatpants and a, and a tank top and it's fine. So there's always... You may get the same budget, but your budget is being allocated for so many different things. I have this conversation with men all the time when, when even showing up for something um, on television. Mm. And when, when people say, you know, we can't put it a line item for this. We can't pay you to be on camera. And I'm like, yeah, but who's paying for my makeup? And it's not to be a doll. No. It's to not look. This is a brilliant you know, point and an important point. And I want to tag it with a different part of the industry because a friend of mine who's a recording artist, mm -hmm. says she has been in sessions 
for her albums mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. she paid for, and men are talking down to her oh, yeah. in her own yeah. sessions. Absolutely. And the studio is a whole, right, you're talking about the stage, right? Yeah. The studio is a different thing. It's extremely masculine, right? Mm-hmm. A lot of hip hop in the recording industry happens between what, midnight and 4 a.m.? Mm-hmm. And if you're an established star, that's one thing. But if you're trying to come up, that can be very dangerous to be the woman who's trying to rap, hanging around the studio late at night, especially when there's quite often groupies who make no pretense, I am not here to get on the mic. I'm here to go home with whoever is ready for me. And you're like, no, no, but take me seriously as a rapper. Right. That's that's a hard, that's a hard that's Absolutely. hard. That's a hard space to break into. Very yeah. hard space to be it's in. A terrible space. And again, I was not the artist in the room, but I was often the person who booked the session, who ordered the PO, who paid for the session, who ordered the equipment. And every single time I'm talking to the end of my career, I had to start from the beginning. So the engineer knew I know what the fuck I'm talking about so that everybody in the room like, oh, my God, like, really, like I trust and as a woman in the recording studio, it is an uphill battle. Mm. It is a Sisyphean freaking task. Like, you start, I mean, it, Lauren, I mean, you know, again and again and again. Like, you know, it's, yeah, no, it's, I mean, Estelle, you know, I worked with Estelle on her album. Oh. It's just very, very hard for women. It's a very masculine space. And it's it's tough. It's I mean, tough. for yeah. all the female rappers we've talked about, very few female producers, mm-hmm. right, yeah. are able to break through, right? Like, we trust women to sing or rap, Miss, but, Missy, like, yeah. you want to touch instruments? You want to touch the board? Here's like, what I'm going to say. You're going to break it. Like, I think there are more female producers than we recognize. It goes back to the the founders aren't getting the money, yeah. the artists aren't getting the budget, and the producers aren't getting the credit. I mean, I saw some interview with Rick Rubin describing what he does to produce, and I'm like, oh, my God, that's what I've been doing for 30 years. Uh, the exact same thing. Good, Carrie. Yeah. Well, I wanted to revisit before we move too far off the topic about your question. I think that women rappers today are talking about the range and dexterity of their lives. I think they are not doing it in relationship to heterosexual relationships. Mm, yes. And they're not so doing it in relationship to male partnership. They are yeah. talking about their inner life. They are talking about their children. Mm-hmm. They are talking about how they want money or how they're getting money. They are talking about their relationship to their body. They are talking mm-hmm. about their mothers, their families, their sisters. They're not necessarily, they're not very obviously centering male partnership or male romantic partnership in their lyrics and how they're describing mm-hmm. their life. So and we have not trained audiences to hear about women without being in context with a man. Mm -hmm. And we think women are like in suspended animation until they have a husband or until they are a mother or until they are around their boss or until they're around whoever. And so I would actually really push back on your Mm -hmm. kind of working thesis. And I think you look at Sweetie. She's rapping about the businesses she's starting. She's rapping about how she's teaching herself shit from business business school manual. She's rapping about her body. She's rapping about her shit, her things. She's rapping about her town. She's rapping about her identity. Those are all the things that can construct a life. Yeah. And those are all the things that, you know, Kiki at McDonald's is thinking about every day. How is she getting money? What is her family up to? What's her body like? What's mm-hmm. her relationship with her body like? Um, what's her inner life? How does she feel? Does she have anxiety? Does she have depression? Does she feel good? Does she mm-hmm. feel swaggy? Right? And so because those have nothing to do with a man, yeah. um, we think of them as less than, but I don't know that they, I don't, I, yeah, I would really push back that the women today aren't as, aren't painting as as cumulative or holistic a view of what it is to be a 25-year-old woman. I think they are, 25-year-old women are decentering romantic relationships and partnerships. And it's no coincidence that the the project that was the most well-received about by Lauren Hill was the one where she was pining the most over a man. Right. Oh, for sure. Mm. Like, and that's the thing, mm. you know? When Lauren was saying, I'm defecating on your microphone, it was like, cool. Wait, what, now you're now you're crying. Like, tell us more. It's like, mm. I, I think that that's also you're you're just so right on because that's what a lot of women of today are rapping about. They're not rapping about men. Mm. No, so why would they get <laughs> like, married? If you're 25, if I'm sweetie, why the fuck would I marry? With the men anybody? of today, are you kidding me? I'd feel like, jeez. No. 
<laughs> you can come over at 10 and then leave by 11 fucking 30. Th- that's Bring that's what I'm saying. Bring snacks. Exactly. Like, are you kidding? What are you talking about? Um, I'll have children when I'm 50 because I'm going to live till I'm 120. There it is. What are you talking about? You know? 1130. I mean, I, I can't even <laughs> stay up that late, but you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> She said, you can stick around. Just let me take the bag of Doritos with me. Well, it's but 11.30 because like, the Uber will take six minutes to come. So. <laughs> right? <laughs> Call it at 11.24. You know, I, hate, I hate the thing that keeps going around. Oh, she didn't write that. Uh, mm-hmm. She didn't write that. We n- almost never talk about men and whether or not they write. Kanye is fairly open that he's not writing every rhyme. That, but I don't hear people denigrating him for that. He's like his own space. But like, it, why do we? Keep, why do we have to? I mean, I think it's men's desire to take successful women mm-hmm. down, mm-hmm. and to, they can't even imagine. Uh, authorship right. like, you know you're a rapper but did you write that rhyme i don't think like mm. that's that 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 whole conversation is consistent and gross yeah i mean i feel you know as a sicilian i'll say men abide by omerta like they don't mm. they, they've got the code when they're in a studio if, if you're writing for another guy you never you never talk about it but i i think that for the men who have written for women they want to stand tall about all these rhymes that they've written about what they, the most unobvious rhymes are the ones written by the men. The most obvious ones are not written by men. It's usually the ones where women are like actively abusing men that often have the pen of a man behind them, which I think is a little interesting. Mm. So, but, and not even like consistently, but there's also things that like men will claim like, yeah, I, I helped you with that ad lib. I wrote the song and it's like, Right. You know, that that's and when you this were talking going to the other way around, like men over claiming credit in the room, literally, whereas women in the room and I'm not it's just not me. I'm just, you know, so many other female artists who are clearly making a contribution that is production, is songwriting, it's is crazy. arranging under sort of credit themselves and are not credited by others and men are like well, yeah I'm, give me 20 percent how much did alia not talk about the song <laughs> she wrote right how much like literally she would go in a studio have the the lyrics written by someone else but she would go in and improvise the entire song based upon concepts that she would be in the studio doing how we have never looked at alia as a songwriter and she actually was but took that back seat for mm-hmm. the team Mm-hmm. So that happened. I mean, that's across the board. I mean, this is not hip hop, but even, you know, Whitney, when she recorded, um, I mean, I worked with her on, on the My Love Is Your Love album. She would come to the studio often three days late. But here's what <laughs> I'll tell you. She showed up. She came. When she, she came. came. Days she came. late. <laughs> but when she got there, she was prepared. And I don't just mean like she knew the song. She was ready to sing the song. She would go in, cut a, you know, rough. And then it was like, open up a track. She had ad libs ready. She had Same. harmonies ready. She had like ideas about the arrangement, the phrasing. Mm-hmm. To, she understood the assignment that she was trying. What, what story is she trying to tell? She understood her instrument. She knows how to move around. She knew how to move around. That's a producer. That's a person so who is not just a voice. Mm-hmm. And I feel that women so often, you know, we say there aren't more women producers i think there are we're just not calling them producers and that's that's a problem interesting um one of the things i loved about ladies first is that it was inclusive as far as it wasn't just the mcs it was also the executives like you drew it was also the fashion like nisa hilton yeah. right and you're bringing in the entirety of all different sorts of women's impact on the genre uh, what is your favorite hip hop fashion trend or idea from that you know from an, any era? I mean, obviously Kim's titty being out. I mean, me and that story. And I remember when that happened. So I was good. watching it live and screamed at my television. Of course, of course. So um, would it have been the full? The, like the full expression of the what Misa and Kim were doing if Diana Ross. 
her grandmother basically had not tapped it. Given it to that like, little <laughs> that little bounce. Like oh my need, god! You kind of needed that to bring it all <laughs> oh the way full, god. right? Like that's like the punchline to the whole right, the whole comedy. Yeah, it's like there's a handful of moments like reading Sulla for the first time and Diana Ross like bouncing <laughs> Kim's tit that really helped me understand my my place in the world. Um, <laughs> And I, I've, I've I understandably watched Ladies First through every edit, through a sat through all the interviews, watched them all a hundred times, and every single time that story, your story yeah. of um, about Kim, excuse me, your Rolling. story about Mary and Meth, and that story about Kim Misa telling that story and being like, you know, uh, what, Missy Elliott saying Kim's such a fly bitch, she could have a tit out like that is just would you would Diana old. Ross. Judging her, or was she like, go ahead, girl? I don't want to ever put my place in anyone's motivation, but from the look on her face, I think she was just tickled. I think she was just yeah. like, the fact that I get to be here and watch this young little girl out here doing something none of us have ever seen and feeling so good about herself and free and powerful, she seemed so tickled by the whimsy of it. She's found, you know, she, I think she thought it was whimsical and hilarious and yeah. charming. You know, this isn't a moment. This is just sort of a uh, an arc. I'm going to go with the nails. I know that sounds crazy, yeah. but I feel like I came here in 1992 and it was it was the white nail salons, it was the little French manicure, and that was it. You know what I'm saying? Like maybe you could get like red. And if you wanted anything else, if you wanted designs, hussy. it was it was <laughs> it was ghetto. Yeah. It was yeah. only it was Fulton Mall. It was in our neighborhoods. And yes. the approach I mean the and I mean, this is something else you guys captured so well in Ladies First, the way they appropriate just the braids, the nails. Everything, the innovation, the all of the styles, and it was ratchet when it was bra black and brown girls, and now it's high mm -hmm. fashion. But I'm just gonna say the evolution of nails and nail designs yes. that I am just seeing on like you know on the whitest of the white folks. Another, I feel hip hop fashion transformation. Kathy, <laughs> of all time. Yeah, anything. The cross colors era was is like. <laughs> My God, left eye. Wait, you were a teenager then? The cross colors era. Thirteen. No, well, yeah. No, well, yeah, I was thir thirteen years old. Yeah. Um, clothing without prejudice made me feel like I belonged. Um, <laughs> but I, um, I had a, I had a Carl Kanai. Carl Kanai. Yeah, uh, vest that I used to wear at a Soul Kitchen. That I thought I was so fly wearing this. Uh, it was way too big. It was like XL. Which is like the thing, but I, I'm sure that I look like shit. But era. I thought it was so good. That era was crazy. I remember I did a thing. It was I was 12 because it was 91, right? I had the Dwayne Wayne glasses, okay. right? And from a different world. From a different world. I didn't know that Left Eye had a condom on the glasses. I thought it was saran wrap and an index card. So I took <laughs> green saran wrap and I balled it up and I cut a square of an index card. And I taped it and I put it, I poked out one of the holes in my Dwayne Wayne glasses and I walked around with my whole <laughs> chest. I I walked around. I had those le the left eye, I had the glasses. We used to wear um pacifiers with the necklaces with the pacifiers mm -hmm. hanging, right? I had one of those. I had my cross colors clothing without prejudice shirt, and I had those big ass, I had the indigo jeans. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You couldn't tell me shit. My 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 ponytail was on the top of my head, mm, right? Nice. And I'll never forget. It was I went to I went to private school for high school, and we had dress down day. And this was in '93, the fall of '93. We had it was like a field day, like we were gonna go whatever. So I was like, okay, now is my chance. <laughs> like I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna show DePaul High School in Wayne, New Jersey, <laughs> what the fuck I'm made of, right? <laughs> I pulled up. And one of the seniors goes, who invited TLC? <gasps> when I tell you that was a defining moment for me, I was like, he knows. <laughs> he saw it. He caught the reaction. He was, I mean, he was trying to diss me, yeah. but he was yeah, like, yeah, he's yeah. like, he said, yeah, who brought TLC? I was like, <laughs> thank you, Matthew, or whatever yeah. the hell his name was. But I was, you know, I mean, I went, so I went to school in, in, in an inner city. I went to school in Patterson. My family was from Patterson, New Jersey. Um, so when I went to high school, I went to high school and all the kids were white. 
like predominantly. Um, mm -hmm. And I didn't, I wasn't used to that. I, I was used to being the only white girl. And I remember going, switching that. I was like, I'm like, I didn't know what to do. Right. Like, mm -hmm. and I remember like as a kid, so I used to um, go to my grandma's cleaners. My family had a cleaners in Patterson and I used to go to this corner store and one day, and I was, I'm like a little kid. So I went to the bodega and they used to sell the African pendants. And I bought one with the money that my mom gave me for like chips for the day. And I came home wearing the African pendant. And my mother goes, like, what you got there? And I go, well, I bought this. And she goes, okay. She sat me down, opened up the encyclopedia and told me all about Africa. Nice. She goes, because if you're gonna wear that, you, gotta know. you better tell everybody everything about Africa. So I then said to her, I said to her, I was like, am I doing something wrong by wearing this? And she goes, just if someone talks to you about it, you like tell them this is what you know, yeah. right? And I've, I'm, I'm, you know, there's part of me from North Africa. So it's like, sure. but come on, right? So, <laughs> but it was like, you know, I started to, I started to understand. And that's when I recognized that like, you know, being an admirer and a fan, like I, I knew at like 10, I had to set my limits to what would be mm. perceived as something else. Mm. And I remember I went to the bodega and the same guy was like, oh, we have like, um, we have like leather hats. You know, the leather hats that yeah. he's like, mm -hmm. they're like, a, not a koofy, but yeah, you know, yeah. and he's like, look, like I saved one for you. And I was like, I can't wear that. And he's like, why? And I was like, because I'm going to offend people. Yeah. And he ordered another African pendant. And this is so funny. I'll never forget this. It said new kids on the block on it. Oh, dear. it didn't have Africa on it. It was just a pen. It was a leather oh, pendant. I see. Imagine new kids on the block, Africa. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, I was so like, what? But it was a le no, it was a, it was a, it was a leather pendant, and it said "New Kids on the Block" instead. Okay. And he goes, "Here, you can wear this one." <laughs> and I thought it was so sweet. But I was thinking, and I was like a "New Kids on the Block" fan, but I was like, Psh. but I thought it was like a kind gesture because he was just kind of trying to say, you know, hey, I get it. But I remember when in school when I went through my cross colors era, yeah, I brought that pendant back out. Not "New Kids on the Block" though. I, I felt. Loved door knockers. Mm. Yeah. I always loved big earrings. I thought it was very cool and bodacious and like audacious and mm -hmm. aggressive. And yeah. even like you have these big hoops, which is pretty much as big as women will wear now. And I'm like, I love like big Thank hoops. You. So there's sort of like a sister, maybe a younger sister of like door. But I just, that, I mean, it was like, you know, you're in a hip hop place. There's when there's girls on. with big door knockers on. Like, Absolutely. So I'm thinking about female rappers who bubbled up and went away, who you personally are like, I wanted to hear more from her. Like, mm. I think about Shorty from De La oh, Soul, yeah. right? She wasn't I mean, from, but she was down with them. But she sure. she was great. I like the sound of her voice. Mm. You know, I like the way she did her thing. And just nothing came of like, you know, she had a great moment of exposure and then, and who knows whatever happened in her life. Um, who is there who you're like, and you already talked about Bahamadia who could go in this category, but like, mm -hmm. is there somebody else who you're like, she got too little time on stage? Yeah. I would actually, the first person that came to my mind when you went down this line, and it's not because they weren't wildly successful in other ways, but a few more rap albums from Queen Latifah, mm -hmm. I think, would have been really amazing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And don't get me wrong, I don't, like, her career is extraordinary, and I think Bahamadia says in Ladies First, it's like a blueprint for black creativity, maybe, mm -hmm. no, Brittany Cooper says that, but... And so all of that's true and exciting, but I think, and and... She was brilliant in how she was able to be a multidisciplinary artist from the inception of her career. But I would have loved a handful of, for sure, a little bit more, for sure, a little bit more rap from yo yo, yo yo, love yo yo man. Yeah. I was ready. Don't try to play me out. Like I was, I wanted more. I wanted more yo yo. She was on the show and she talked about. Cube was saying bitch a lot, and she was like, can yeah. you calm that down? And yeah. he's like, okay. yeah, You know, and like not just accepting her environment or what her mentor or whatever is saying, mm -hmm. but like, no, we're getting, can we clean it up a little bit? Yeah, yeah. Kathy. It was interesting. We asked her why we why she thinks, I don't, I don't think it made it into any of the final episodes. Maybe I shouldn't be saying this, but 
she, we asked her why she thinks men use that language. And she was like, someone broke their heart. Mm. And it was this really tender, wow. but very honest. She's like, someone broke their heart, you know, a mm. woman broke their heart and they, they haven't recovered. Mm. There's mm. that. <laughs> there's <laughs> like, mom. There's there's like you also, tender little baby. But there's also like <laughs> just basic misogyny. Yeah. Especially sure. that can rise up thinking about being in the studio with a bunch of guys and, you know, what can you say that will get all the guys interested? Fuck that bitch and fuck her. Like, mm. you know, like. Oh, and like all the guys are gonna be like, "Yeah, you're the shit," right? And why? Why would you cheer uh, that? Uh, Maybe somebody broke one of their hearts, but and everyone else had to go along with it yeah. because of I the mean, one camaraderie. Yeah. You know but the like, way, especially among young men, that I can express my sense of having power in the world by beating up another man or expressing I can beat you up to where he has to retreat, or I can beat you in a sport that we both care about. So I'm spirit. Or I'm better at girls than you, but that has to involve I didn't get my heart in it, right? So yeah. you have like as a young man, like you have a dope girlfriend that you care about. You buy flowers for her, like not impressed. But you you mm -hmm. smash that hot chick and you kept it moving, like yeah. I don't understand that. I mean, I've never been an adolescent male, so I have no <laughs> idea. But that 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 group dynamic is. I mean, don't get me wrong, adolescent women played. <laughs> our own versions of games and power dynamics and working things out in a community. But yeah, that sort of like, let's root for each other's harm has always <sighs> perplexed me, whether it's physical or emotional. But they don't, but you see each other, they, they are saying these things because they don't see the women as a full part of themselves or their community. I guess I'm saying that they're That's harming right. themselves. Mm. They so yes, they're that. harming they us, yes, they don't right. but they just don't You know, the other thing somebody said harming. to me, a big part of why men treat the women in their lives the way they do is because they're angry at their mom. Yeah. yeah. Mm. And they can't say or take it out on mom. <laughs> Absolutely. But I can on you and your another mother figure that was the heartbreak Absolutely. i mean that's yeah. the seminal so heartbreak. yeah the heart yeah the heartbreak is not from the girl in the yeah, street yeah. Mom. but mom yeah and gotta break these cycles yeah. mm. Mm. oh my um what were we talking about yeah <laughs> <laughs> who we want to hear more from so, but you made it deep i love that you were doing fashion what happened yeah. i don't know so funny enough the first person who came to my mind but i i was remember nonchalant five mm -hmm. o'clock in the morning i always wanted more from nonchalant but mm. that's not who i really would want like more and more from it moni love yeah she sounded like she was smiling as yes. she was laughing and yeah. it was the sound of her voice was so nice she just looks like sunshine mm -hmm. yes she does like that's and yeah like moni love always just made me feel so good yeah. uh, like more, more Moni. And she seemed like I am part of the group. They yes. love me mm -hmm. like a sister. Yeah. I am equal mm -hmm. to them. Mm -hmm. I'm not dating any of them. Like mm -hmm. they know we're not, don't talk to me like that. Like we're all rappers together and they respected her and I like that whole vibe. Yeah. I'm going to shout out Sweet Tea too. Yeah. Oh, oh my God. Sweet I love tea. Sweet Tea. <laughs> I used to know that song by heart. She's oh my God. Gosh. And then I, she's on the show soundtrack. Oh. What's up, star? And I just think it's so dope. And it's like, what's up, star? Something like, let's get drinks at the bar. If I like what I see, then the drinks is on me. It was like, again, she was in control. Mm. And I loved that. And I wanted to hear more oh. from her. You know, you made me go back to, of course, Roxanne Chante. Of course. Yeah. Which I was all into hip hop from the first time I heard Rapper's Delight. Yeah. Getting all these cassettes and whatever. And it was guys, 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 guys. And, you know, as a young male, I, I was not saying, where's the chicks? I'm like, guys are doing their thing. Cool. And um, and 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 they did their record, the real you know, Roxanne. And when she came out, I was like, oh, yeah. "What was that? <laughs> Listen to this voice. Listen to the way she takes them down. Like, fuck you, ain't shit." I'm like, "This yeah. is great. I love At her." 15, oh no less. At fifteen, no less. Embraces. I mean, unbelievable. And so much force yes. in her spirit and the way she rhymed and the sound of the voice. <sighs> unbelievable. She was so great. The way that that story, I I loved. Um, Fly Ty, he told me the story like for for God Save the Queens about how that came together. And him 
and Marley Marl and Mr. Magic were all together, like talking about how they were going to get back at UTFO because they weren't going to go do a concert that they were supposed to do. That was, they all had prepared the money for Christmas that was going to come from this concert because Mr. Magic called the next, the single for UTFO to make them famous or whatever. And they ended up canceling on the concert. It was like, how are we going to get them back? And while they're having this conversation, Shantae is walking by pushing her mother's laundry and she goes, I'll do it. And they like all like look and, and, and she's like, I'll do it. Let me do it. And that's like literally how it went down. Then they put her in a studio and she just started talking shit. Like the fact that this little girl is like pushing laundry, heading back to her apartment. And they're like, how are we going to get these guys? How are we going to get them? How are we going to get them? And she said, I'll do it. Put me in coach. Put me in the <laughs> Yeah. And I mean, you know, no, nothing is more devastating than a woman saying you ain't shit. Mm. Right. Right. The guys saying you ain't shit like, yeah, whatever. But then this chick comes and like... Like, oh, you have cut me to my core now. <laughs> well, it was so funny. The funniest part is like when she says, basically says like Hangul, because she's like, you're named after a hat. Like she's like, what a, <laughs> like, she's like, I'm, I'm going to take, I'm going to take cues from a guy named after a hat. <laughs> like imagine like, that's like somebody like attacking fitted Frank, right? Like, it's just like, you're named after a hat. Why lower your voice? <laughs> like <laughs> lower your voice. Ray, you better sit down. You're named after a hat, motherfucker. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Well, this has been so much fun. Uh, it's so deep and so illuminating. Carrie and Drew and Kathy, thank you thank so you. much for everything. I love you thank guys. You. Thank you. Uh, Thanks for listening to another episode of Torre Show. Torre Show gives you fuel to power your dreams because you can use your dreams like a rocket ship to blast you into a life you never imagined. You can make your dreams a reality and maybe this show can help. Torre Show is written by me, Torre, and produced by Jennifer Brown. Our editor is Ryan Woodhull. Our booker is Claudia Jean. And we're distributed by DCP Entertainment. And we will be back on Wednesday with more amazing guests because the man can't shut us down. Oh, <laughs>